Hi everyone, um, I'm going to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, Dale Manami is the founder of ABBA and Asian Law Caucus and too many other organizations uh, to mention. And he's been a friend and a mentor to many of us in this room. And so, but there are some of you who haven't uh, met Dale before and we thought in this year where we are um, uh, uh, reconnecting with the purpose of ABBA, uh, engaging in advocacy, that uh, we thought it would be nice to hear from Dale about the founding of the organization, where he thinks that, uh, what, what he thinks we should be focusing on, and also to have a conversation uh, between uh, you and him. So, Dale. Thank you. Um, yeah, it means I'm really old, because uh, we started talking about ABBA in 1975, only we had an East Bay group, and just a little bit of history, and because I think it's important. And we started this uh, group called in the East Bay, called the, and it grew out of the Asian Law Caucus experience that we were part of. Uh, it was called the Coalition of Asian Lawyers or something. We, we made up something. And we had heard that there was another group in uh, San Francisco that was trying to put together a uh, an Asian American Bar Association type of group. Our group was focused on a couple things. One is appointments of judges uh, to diver diversify the judiciary, which was, you know, really uh, non-diverse at the time. The group in San Francisco were more like business oriented, so they wanted to put together groups that could, you know, exchange uh, clients or refer each other clients. Uh, we were friends with some of the folks. Some some of them were my age. Um, at this point, it's kind of sad I'm thinking about this, but you know, everyone has passed on of those original founders. In, in our group, we had about four people, five people. One of them was Ken Kawaichi, who's a judge. He's still around. The other one is a guy named Mike Lee that a lot of people don't, don't know about, but um, he was one of the founders of the Asian Law Caucus. Uh, he moved on to private I mean, a, a practice in San Francisco at Legal Aid. And in about 1975, we started getting together with the group in San Francisco because Mike knew some of these folks. And uh, we sat down to have these series of meetings. Actually, they were kind of drink fests because we, <laughs> one of the uh, original founders was a guy named William Jack Chow. And he owned a restaurant called the Four Seas in San Francisco. And we would always go to the Four Seas. And we'd meet, oh, we also met at Chinatown Legal Aid. Uh, and then we started hatching out uh, discussion about what this group would do. The San Francisco group, again, tended to be a little more business oriented. We were more social justice oriented and uh, diversity oriented. Um, but we came to an agreement that, you know, we should try to have an organization. Uh, we named it the Asian American Bar Association. Uh, there were about, about seven or eight people who were involved in that original group. Um, because there was a disparity or difference between perspectives, uh, we kind of figured out that we needed to develop, well, Mike and I especially developed a idea or a plan that we needed to put this organization on a progressive track. And if you don't do that early on, if you don't create what I call a mythology of a group, then the culture uh, that you create could uh, dissolve into simply becoming a trade organization, which means you do nothing but make money for each other. Well, we've had, we had some serious discussions. The San Francisco group said, well, we'll just appoint ourselves as presidents and vice presidents. And Mike and I said, no, we have to have an election. You can't do this with this group. And of course, there weren't a lot of Asian Pacific Islander attorneys at the time. And we said, you have to have an election. Uh, and they said, no, we don't need to have an election. We'll just appoint ourselves and we'll just run it. So Mike and I were insistent that we had to have an election. And um, uh, at the time, uh, there were a lot of uh, older attorneys. <laughs> they were like younger than I am now, but uh, there were really a lot of older attorneys, and we were in our you know, early 30s. Um, and, but we knew that in terms of critical mass, because of affirmative action, uh, the number of Asian attorneys had grown significantly by 1976 when we started organizing. And I remember one meeting, it was a pivotal meeting where we decided to have, let's have a group meeting. We hadn't decided on whether to have an election or not yet, but we decided to call a group meeting of all the Asian attorneys that we could find or know and bring them to a meeting and we could 
pre present you know, a plan for an Asian American Bar Association. Well, at the meeting, we said, well, we can have, there's a, some groups that want to present at this meeting, and uh, they want to present a proposal. And it was not Asians, they were Latinos from Texas. They were migrant farm workers who wanted support for their attempt to unionize in Texas. Well, that was pretty far afield from the, some of the people's perspective about what they wanted to do with an Asian American Bar Association. But in the middle of this meeting, there turned out to be maybe 60 attorneys there. And most of them were our friends. And so the older attorneys didn't know these young attorneys at all. And most of them were products of affirmative action. Most of them were therefore much more liberal or progressive than the folks who didn't want to have an election. So Mike, uh, out of the blue, just said, I, I want to pass a resolution. I want to move to support the Texas farm workers. And um, we said, the, we let Jack Chow, he was the oldest member of the group, uh, run that meeting. And he said, well, let's, uh, we'll have a vote, and then we'll discuss some of the other electoral issues. We had the vote, and because of, um, it, was a, it was a hand vote, and all, all of our friends, probably 55 of them voted, yeah, we want to support them. And the other five, who were more of the conservative types, you know, saw what was going on and realized, whoa, we're, we're outvoted completely. And so the thing, it passed unanimously. <coughs> Next day we had a meeting and Jack Chow and the other young, uh, older attorneys said, yeah, we need to have an election. They knew that if they didn't have an election, make it democratic, because that was the basis in Mike and I position was that it had to be a demo democratic election. If we didn't have that, then we're, we're, we're not a legitimate organization. And to Jack's credit and some of the other folks, they agreed we're going to have an election. So what we did is we thought, okay, we're going to have an election, we're going to have a board, so we're going to run a slate. And so we wanted to keep the older attorneys because they had resources, they had contacts, and they were really decent people who wanted to do something for the community as well as for themselves. Uh, so we ran a slate for the board. We ran Jack Chow or we acceded to the idea of Jack Chow becoming the first president. Uh, he was well-known, well-regarded um, businessman in Chinatown, and then we had, took 10 of the 12 seats. So in other words, we had a really liberal board. I had uh, stolen the bylaws from the Japanese American Bar Association. <laughs> uh, oh, no, excuse me, it was the Southern California Chinese American Association, which was the first uh, Asian bar in California, then the Japanese American bar in Los Angeles. I had a lot of friends down there because I grew up there. And I just basically took their bylaws and, well, we didn't have search and replace then. It was an IBM Selectric. <laughs> you, you all don't know what an IBM Selectric even is, probably. But um, um, we redid the bylaws, only changed the name and put uh, ABBA on it. Um, what was different for us is we didn't have critical mass that they had in Los Angeles of a group of Chinese Americans, a group of Japanese Americans. That's why they formed separate organizations. We had also come from a culture up here, inclusive culture of Asian American. So it wasn't just simply uh, a, one ethnic group or you know, a, series, a number of ethnic groups having their own bar. We felt that, number one, is that we didn't have critical mass. We needed to, to bring everybody together to present a stronger front politically, because we, our idea as, as it evolved at that time was to participate in bar activities, to lobby for judges, to uh, cross-refer cases. You know, we, th this was not a concession, it was just something that was a smart thing to do, to help our uh, Asian American attorneys grow and thrive, uh, and to take positions on public issues. Well, the conservative folks didn't want to do that as much. And at that time, you know, there's a raging issue of affirmative action, Baki versus the University of California. And when we voted, of course, the, the, the uh, uh, board members that we had, which we essentially owned that organization, because we had 10 out of 12 votes, and we, uh, uh, we, we uh, you know, were able to take positions on progressive issues. 
We did one thing that was a little bit strange at that time, but we had a plan for that. And the idea was that the president got to pick the uh, a nominating committee. The nominating committee then nominated specific people for offices the next year. When we knew that Jack would nominate one of his friends who was going to be much more like he was, which is, you know, you, you can call him conservative, but you know, in San Francisco, if you're moderate, you're really, you're really a communist in the rest of the country, just about or socialist at least. So, so I mean, I can't. I, when I say conservative, I don't mean like you know, this guy is a raging uh, Donald Trump, uh, but but they just had a little different attitude. So of course, he did nominate somebody that was more conservative, and we ran a write-in campaign, which was you know Mike Lee. Michael G. W. Lee. Mike, by the way, became we became partners, and then uh, we we were not. But then we dissolved that partnership. But he also became president of the San Francisco Bar Association, the first uh, minority president. Really great guy. He never gets credit for anything like the caucus or the ABBA or the bar presidency because he doesn't really care. He's really just uh, just a terrific person. Uh, and one of the last remaining living. Uh, reminders of the, the Asian American Bar Association founding. So we ran Mike Lee as a write-in candidate, and he just won spectacularly. Um, I was uh, uh, nominated, or I took the position of secretary. I forgot how that happened. So that was the only, that was the only formal position I've ever had in ABBA. I think I was on the board for a number of years before, but I never was an officer. Um, but Mike became president. And at that point, we started unfolding the agenda of social justice, of taking positions on issues, of filing amicus briefs on issues that affect Asian Pacific Islanders, of, um, of mentoring, of bringing in younger people to uh, help create, again, this culture that we wanted to create. And the culture was, uh, we were a product of our community. We have a debt to our respective Asian Pacific Islander communities, not just the legal community, but the outside community uh, larger than just lawyers. Because as lawyers, we all tend, we gravitate toward leadership positions in the community, or we're seen as that. And therefore, we felt we had a responsibility not just to do things for the lawyers to get more Asians in the judiciary, um, more uh, take positions on is legal issues, but we felt an obligation to do more to support this community and uh, uh, do legal work for them, but also take positions on issues. So that part of the culture, I think, has uh, just thrived. I just see the kind of people that have gone through ABBA as the, on the presidency and, and the board in the committees, and they've adopted, or perhaps they had that uh, perspective from the start, which drew them to ABBA. And to me, that was uh, a wonderful, wonderful um, history that uh, evolved to this day. I also think what I like about ABBA is the social aspects. You know, I always like to party. So, <laughs> so I mean, that's why we, we were drinking and, and figuring out how to put this organization together. And uh, um, so the ABBA, of course, parties like crazy. As <laughs> and what it's also held as a core, it's, it's held the center, and the center being an Asian American organization. Not to say that other organizations should not form their own because they have their own specific um, perspectives as well, but they also become part of ABBA as well, which I think is a terrific thing. Eventually in LA, it was in interesting to, in LA, which formed the Southern California Chinese, there was a uh, Japanese, and then there were two Filipino organizations, um, which uh, uh, I don't know how many there are now, but there are different ones all over. But eventually, where they started as separate organizations, you know, they started then emerging to form a PABA, Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And so that was kind of like, uh, we, they, they did it, I think, backwards in a sense. I can't say it's backwards, but differently. And so they have a unified Asian American Bar Association, Asian Pacific American Bar Association in LA that's, that's really similar in values to ABBA. Um, uh, they have a lot of good leaders. In fact, one of the founders is Dolly G, who is now uh, Judge Do Dolly G, who is 
uh, giving tr fits to Trump's administration by requiring the unification of these children separated from the from their parents at the border when they're seeking asylum. Uh, and she was one of the founders, along with uh, people like Mia Yamamoto, you know, one of the most famous, maybe the most famous transgender um, uh, lawyer, criminal defense lawyer, uh, who's also a terrific person too. And so they, they formed their group and uh, we have our Abba up here, they have their Apaba down there. Charles has worked with folks to form the Kel Apaba, uh, which I think is similar to what we did at one point in time. We had put together the coalition of all the Asian American bars in California. And then, at that time, there were only about 10. So it was not a hard thing to do. And we called it the ABC, Asian Bar of California. And we felt that we could reflect uh, a statewide perspective rather than our own local Northern California or the Southern California or San Diego. And that way we could aggregate, again, uh, the power of both numbers or the illusion of power in some cases. Uh, but it eventually became uh, defunct and moribund. And Charles and, and a lot of people have uh, revived that organization, which I think is a really wonderful thing. Anyway, so there's a lot of evolution of different groups that have now become part of the Asian Pacific American Bar of California, Calapaba. Uh, and it's good to see that we have some at least um, coherent or cohesive, semi-cohesive organizations that can reflect the interests of Asian lawyers. Having gone to that judges event, uh, how many of you went to the 100 judges event? It was spectacular to me because when we started, um, you know, I gave a little talk and there were only 14 Asian Pacific Islander judges in California. That was in 1976 when we started lobbying. And now there are over, I think, 130, uh, I've heard. And to see that development, um, to see the growth of ABBA, to see a PABA uh, is really gratifying. So I think... That's as much as I have. I have a lot more to say, but it just usually it's not that interesting. So if you have questions, that would be um, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So thank you. Any questions for Dale? It's the first, and it all it will always be the first. Asian American Bar Association. So in some sense, it, it exerts a gravitational pull that some people, you know, they don't want to be moons out there just revolving around ABBA. Uh, they, they, they probably want their, their own moon. To, uh, and that's not, not necessarily a bad thing, as long as there's coordination and there's not uh, so much competition. Uh, John, you? Did, uh, you, you spoke just now about the, the civil rights and the progressive founding of the organization. Do you have any advice or thoughts for the, the new leaders of the organization about how to carry that into the future? Yeah, I, I think um, the advice is still just read the newspapers for one and see what's going on and be willing to take positions. I think, uh, you know, it's a 501c5. I'm six. six. Okay, so there are some limitations, but you could take position on issues completely. That's one thing. I think the amicus brief that uh, we used to file, that's now that's been taken over by NAPABA, if it's, it's national, and other organizations. Uh, I think keeping in touch, you know, with community groups is important because it's easy, I think, to start disengaging from the community that's your, your base, that's your that's that's uh, you you know the soil that we grow up in, and then you grow up and you become uh, rich and famous and powerful like Abba has become, <laughs> and, and it's easy to kind of neglect some of the more critical issues that are occurring in the community, and so folks to bring up those kind of issues. I mean, the Texas farm workers was way out of the blue in my mind, um, and I guess you need a mission statement, which you now have. Uh, a criteria for taking positions on issues, and I think that'll guide you to uh, a place where you continue to do, I think, in, engage and also involve the uh, vision that I think we, we had when we started. So it hasn't, it really hasn't changed that much. It's gotten bigger and more powerful, more organized, uh, a lot more people, you know, and so it's wonderful. It's, it's grown to this extent. Yeah. Oh. 
So what do you hope the legacy of Otto will be 50 years and 100 years into the future? 50, 100 years, I can't even think that far. <laughs> Number one is I hope climate uh, change doesn't kill us all. <laughs> so we'll still be here, okay? Um, and, and what I've seen is just an evolution. And I've seen an evolution, not only talent, I was talking to Mary Jean uh, just a, a while earlier, to see Asians now in litigation, in all, not just litigation, you know, cor uh, corporate leadership in doing every single thing to infiltrate and, and get into all these different areas of law is really remarkable. The diversity of different practices, skills, and especially people, from my point of view, not especially, but people who litigate is really uh, uh, gratifying. So I'm thinking, and I, I can't see that far in the future. In fact, without some of the other leaders we had, uh, you know, my vision is, is not a great is, is very short. Uh, so I would, if they told, asked me this 40 years ago, I would have said, I don't know. I just hope they continue to have parties. And uh, <laughs> I hope they keep taking stands on issues and becoming, staying relevant. Um, I think the recognition that if continues to just grow, and I think one of the critical parts of the culture is not just the social justice, it's also a culture of welcoming, a culture of inclusion. So that when new people come in and they don't feel, you know, there are cliques inside that they get uh, um, shut out of, that people get welcomed into the organization. And I think uh, getting in touch with students, you know, you recruit them early on and they know that they're going to have a, a place for ABBA. I think also, you know, uh, jobs. And this is the trade organization part that I still think is important now is that there's a job bulletin board so younger people have the idea that, you know, ABBA is important for uh, their future or their careers. So 100 years from now, it's hard to think of. Um, and I, I think I, what I would hope, though, is that ABBA continues to have leaders that are reaching out to other minorities of color, affinity groups, so that they're still that type of connection. It doesn't have to be unity because it probably never will be, but it also has, you have some kind of connection. And that as ABBA grows, um, it will be inclusive and able to try to accomplish all of those from social justice to, you know, taking stands on issues to, you know, uh, referring, cross-referring to, you know, having seminars to having parties, all of that. You know, I, I gave a talk 15 years ago, maybe in New York, for the Asian American Journalists Association. And I said one of the biggest challenges for any organization as you get bigger uh, is that you, you tend less to uh, maintain your principles of your mission. And when Charles told me earlier, you know, you were going to try to get a mission statement, I said, we don't have a mission statement? And, you know, of course, we were, when we were there in 76 or whenever it was, you know, we didn't even think of that. So remaining true to a mission statement and having a mission statement is absolutely fundamental. And, and I could tell you this from my own failure of not having one for all these years I've been involved. Uh, but I just think it's really critical. You need a touchstone for you to make decisions and a touchstone of a mission statement to be able to communicate to new folks, this is what we're about. And if we're not about helping people and doing the right thing or maintaining that type of basic core principles, then it, it is either easier to get dissolute. It, 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 uh, the unity kind of dissolves and people then have uh, more conflicts and I see that with Nepaba at some level that they're fighting all the time to maintain that culture based on a mission statement that is inclusive and tries to do good and do well. Um, so I think as you get larger, it's harder to keep it organized and keep people on the same page just simply because there are more people. And I think that mission statement then is perhaps the most significant accomplishment in recent years. And that's important.
right, if there are no further Good. questions, uh, I think no, they'll question, have to rest my case. his daughters. I do. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all.